Welcome to today's Academy Live webcast, Environmental Science on the Cloud with Windows Azure. Kenji, you now have the floor. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming along uh, to this webinar. Um, so this is part of our um, Windows Azure, Azure for Research program, which I'll be telling you more about um, later on. Um, and as part of this uh, program, we actually are looking at different uh, uses of cloud computing in different disciplines. Uh, and what we see is that in um, uh, environmental science, uh, with the any of the challenges uh, that are coming, um, that cloud computing is really uh, very very useful and usable um, for many many uh, environmental scientists around the world, um, both in large projects. Um, but also in um, smaller projects as well. Um, so as part of this uh, Azure for Research program, uh, we do have a couple of Twitter tags. Uh, so um, at Azure for Research is our account, or hash um, Azure Research is on there. Um, another thing that we've been building up is a community around uh, LinkedIn. Uh, so if you are on LinkedIn, uh, then look for Windows Azure for Research. Uh, and please do sign up to that because that's a, a great place for us uh, to talk to you and uh, let you know what's going on. Uh, we're kicking off a bunch of discussions there. Um, and also we, we've set up a subgroup uh, on there for questions around using Azure for research. So there is a forum for Windows Azure for sort of technical questions, sort of deep technical questions. Uh, and that's a great place to go at windowsazure.com. But for research questions, so for instance, you know, I'm, I have this research project and I'm thinking about using the cloud and I have data and I have compute and can I have a bit of help? Has anyone else got any experience with this? Clearly that's more on the research side than just on the pure uh, Azure development side. So that's why we've created the uh, LinkedIn group. Um, so we have a few hundred members on there already. Um, so please do uh, join that uh, group if you can. Um, so I'm, I'm in Microsoft Research. Uh, Microsoft Research is um, about a thousand people worldwide, and we have uh, researchers doing all sorts of uh, different uh, things. And one of those things is environmental science. Um, but we also have researchers in cloud computing, in algorithms, in data, uh, machine learning. We have uh, hundreds of researchers looking at machine learning. So uh, it's really interesting how we, both internally and working with the research community, uh, uh, take some of the technologies we're working on uh, and develop those together. Um, and Windows Azure is a cloud computing platform. We are working closely with the community to do that. Um, and so this webinar is really about uh, how uh, we are doing that. So again, the, the website is called azureforresearch.com. My email address is on there, so please do email me if you want uh, any more details um, about this. Um, so we, we've got a few attendees now, so I'm going to kick off. Um, uh, and I'm really happy, actually, that uh, as part of this webinar, uh, we're joined by a couple of our very special guests. Uh, so Tanya is from the University of Illinois at Chicago, uh, and she is a computer scientist, uh, but moved into uh, using a lot of her expertise uh, in the areas of sort of environmental science and ecology, and she's doing some very exciting things and, and looking forward to uh, doing many, many things with the cloud and out in the field, and she'll be telling us all about that a, a little bit later on uh, during the webinar. Uh, and then Christian uh, is joining us. Um, and he has a, a great project called Live Andes, uh, which is a sort of conservation and biodiversity project. Uh, and he'll be talking about that and how he's um, been developing that and moving that to the cloud uh, to make it much more, um, you know, scalable uh, um, there. So um, we're really excited to have Tanya and Christian. Uh, they're actually in the U.S. I'm, I'm here in the Microsoft Research Lab in Cambridge, so we're across a couple of time zones. Um, and, and it's great to see uh, many of you from, from other countries. So, so thanks, thanks for joining us. Um, so what's interesting, I think, today um, in all science uh, and all research, uh, just in the world around us, is the amazing pace of technology. So many uh, new ways of communicating, uh, gathering data, and this, this immense power for doing computation, even in a mobile phone or a smartphone, the amount of computation we have there is equivalent to what we had with supercomputers uh, just a few uh, decades ago. Uh, so it's absolutely amazing what can be done 
Um, and the challenge often is how can we apply lots of this great technology in a sensible way to advance our research. Um, there are lots of projects which do technology for technology's sake, um, and that can push things forwards, um, but importantly for researchers, um, applying the technology uh, in a very uh, usable way is important, uh, and that's why one of those technologies, I think, is cloud computing, uh, and that's kind of what we want to drill down on today uh, during, this, uh, during this webinar. So, uh, as I said in Microsoft Research, we actually have a, an environmental science research group, um, and they're interested in, again, pushing the state of the art in areas like uh, biodiversity. We've got some work around carbon modeling, uh, species modeling, species distribution modeling, migration, and developing new concepts and methods, again, as part of this bigger piece of Microsoft Research, uh, and uh, more broadly, Microsoft, uh, the global company. Um, and critically, it's joining up uh, theoretical ecology um, with field ecology, experimental ecology, and using computational techniques um, in order to help with that. Um, and a lot of other areas, for instance, in engineering, where we use predictive models to build bridges and aircraft, um, the group uh, in Microsoft Research is looking at how can we build those types of predictive models for ecosystems and the Earth system. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's really nice that within Microsoft Research we have the technology, but we have this uh, set of researchers uh, here in the Cambridge lab who are you know, really at the forefront of pushing the boundaries of environmental science. So I think it's fair to say that uh, within environmental science, we're in this sort of perfect storm. Uh, in many areas, it's great in terms of the data that we can collect, remote sensing, more and more advanced satellites going up, making that data much more available to everyone. Uh, incredible unmanned air vehicles, so, you know, quadcopters, unmanned planes, very cheap sensors, cheap cameras, IR cameras, motion sensors, the ability to build a camera trap um, for, you know, just tens, a few hundreds of dollars. Um, the fact that we have uh, the Internet and the World Wide Web and we can uh, move data around and we can execute computation at huge scale um, across the network is great. So those are good things. Um, but the challenge is actually how can we use that uh, to our advantage because this growth is fairly organic in terms of uh, people everywhere are, you know, collecting their own data, creating their own algorithms. We typically publish in the literature and scientific publications, but we often don't detail uh, right down to the nuts and bolts how we're managing all of this pipeline. Um, and that can make reproducibility quite dif difficult in terms of the science. Uh, and also just how to work together, particularly across disciplines or across even sub-disciplines. Um, uh, and that's, I think, one of the challenges that we face as the data becomes more readily available. Do you feel free to ask questions online um, uh, uh, using using the IM. Um, so hi to, to Leonard on there so from Columbia. So we're getting people from all over the world, which is absolutely fantastic. So within, particularly in environmental science, I think data um, so is the spice of life. You know, we, can, we gather lots of data. Um, lots of that's manual measurement, uh, field records, um, whether that's counting or typing. Um, collecting samples, we have automated systems like towers, um, historical photos over decades, uh, and increasingly with supercomputers, for instance, model output, uh, and also sensors that we can, for instance, put on animals and get GPS tracks and accelerometer tracks. And there's so many different uh, feeds of data, essentially, um, which again is great, and often those pieces of data are collected individually. Um, and again, one of the challenges, I think, is, is the uh, integration of that. And if we get that right, we can really improve the value of that data. And so we often think about tra translating data into information uh, and then using that information in order to gather scientific insight. And I think increasingly, particularly in, in environmental science, uh, we will need to take that insight and turn that into uh, decision support tools uh, for policymakers or crisis management um, as another step just beyond the pure science. Um, and so we do want to move up this, this ladder, really, and, and you know, an example, for instance, would be in water management, water security, um, going from gathering the data, making sure that data is sufficient quality, um, which I think is an area where, you know, we are making a lot of progress, 
Um, but then actually managing that data, aggregating it, distributing it, making it understandable and usable is a real challenge. Uh, then going one step further and integrating that performing analysis and then doing this predictive modeling. So there are some serious challenges, but uh, really, really valuable if we can manage to do this um, across different subdisciplines and again, you know, particular areas like, for instance, water management, um, but also then to be able to integrate across those sub-disciplines where there is real benefit to be had. So this idea of collecting data um, was we, Jim Gray, who was one of our researchers uh, at Microsoft, coined this term the fourth paradigm uh, data intensive scientific discovery. So the first three paradigms you could uh, argue were sort of experimental observational science, then theoretical science with the evolution of mathematics, and then computational science uh, in the context of sort of simulation. And we're now in this world of you know, aggregating data, making use of that data, uh, inferring insight from that data. Uh, and when we think about that with data at the center, um, it's quite interesting in how we can build out systems and services to help scientists uh, and how we can actually work in different ways in some of these very large you know, collaborative projects um, for instance, the Large Hadron Collider, the New Square Kilometer Array, but you know, clearly in environmental science, for instance, climate science, where climate scientists work closely together um, in order to get a, a common view of what the world is doing. Um, so an example of this is actually our uh, Jeff Dozier, um, who is a hydrologist, and he's been thinking about this in terms of snow hydrology and snow melt, which is very important, for instance, in predict predicting droughts and using this, con this idea of taking the data uh, and doing modeling around the data in order to create these sort of predictive models. Uh, and so he's really been pushing, one of the people pushing this idea of this fourth paradigm of science and how it can change the way we think about science and how we do science. But when we do this, one of the challenges is around data integration. So we have all this data, but it's in different formats. So it could be raster point vector, you know, different time series with different time um, uh, intervals. Vocabulary and meaning can be different to different people, even within the same sort of sub-discipline or discipline. Um, so we get into this idea of ontologies and common vocabularies, which gets very complicated very quickly. Also, the sparsity of data um, and, you know, how we acquire that data is interesting. We were just having a conversation today about looking at the bird species distribution in Australia uh, and, uh, you know, it's very aligned with the road network. Um, again, you know, the um, checking to see how your data is observed is very important when you start making inferences around that. So we really need to understand that um, carefully. And then again, integrating sort of spatial and temporal uh, variation. So all of these challenges around, around data, we have this huge opportunity with data, um, but a huge challenge on how we can work with it much more effectively. And so there are some issues with this, and I think one of the uh, interesting opportunities is when we can basically tie together all these different types of data from the individual scientist, the individual observer who could be out on a reserve in Africa with a pair of binoculars who is, uh, you know, tirelessly sitting there recording, um, you know, the instances of zebras or tigers, right through to the largest groups in the world running global climate simulations generating petabytes of data. How can we get all of these people working together so that they can take advantage of all the, diff the work being done around the world? Um, the, the issue of trust and provenance becomes quite important there. Um, and, uh, and recording exactly how we've collected the data, how the data's passed around, how it's shared, um, different concerns around misuse of the data, that if we just push out raw data, uh, that people might not, they might misunderstand it and misinterpret that and that could be potentially quite damaging. Uh, and in order to do this, the tools differ greatly from people who have access to the biggest supercomputers in the world through to, for instance, people using, you know, cameras, uh, even smartphones out in the field uh, in order to collect data. So, um, you know, we do have to think about this, but if we can get it right uh, and we can manage this and push this into a pipeline, for instance, with modeling, and then, you know, there are huge gains that can be had. Um, so one of the interesting areas, and, and I think the time is very ripe for cloud computing um, in, its, in its quite broad sense of this kind of ubiquitous uh, platform for data and compute, 
um, which you know most people, many people experience, for instance, through their smartphones, through their tablet devices, where a lot of the functionality is delivered through the cloud. Um, so I just want to ask in the audience uh, maybe to see you know how many of you uh, um, use cloud computing uh, or just here to be sort of curious about it. So you can just click on here um, uh, in order to um, answer answer this poll, just to get a little feel for uh, uh, you know all of you out there. Um, uh, and, and you know, so what your level of is here, um, because I'm now going to sort of start talking about uh, cloud computing itself, particularly uh, uh, a little bit around uh, Windows Azure, uh, which is Microsoft's cloud computing platform, uh, to try and give you a bit of insight not just to what it is, um, but also importantly how it's being used or how it can be used for environmental science. Um, and so, so yeah, so so it's interesting. Yeah, a lot of you here are actually starting to play with cloud computing. Uh, which is great, and I think uh, certainly one of the things with Windows Azure we try hard with is to make that really easy, easy to do. So if anybody else wants to jump in and and uh, you know stick your vote in there, uh, then please go ahead. Um, and uh, you know if anyone else has any um, uh, questions, uh, so we've asked about the presentation slide. So this whole um, webinar will be made available um, sort of afterwards, and so certainly we'll we'll make make these slides slides there for you as well so you can drill down and in, in certainly in my slide deck there are a few hyperlinks in there uh, that you can follow um, so that you can follow up uh, from this webinar. So so it looks like a lot of you actually are aware of cloud computing and are starting to use it which is fantastic. So I just want to now spend a little bit of time uh, hopefully talking about cloud computing and so there are lots of diff definitions of cloud computing and so we could say that cloud computing is essentially again this ubiquitous resource um, that sits somewhere on the network um, where I can get compute and data. And fundamentally what it means is I can get that compute, that data, different services, uh, whatever I want, uh, and I can get that whenever I need it. Um, and that's, I think, a key feature of cloud computing where other uh, technologies and platforms, so like supercomputers, for instance, certainly uh, are fantastic, um, but you can't always get access to those when you absolutely need it because you might not have actually be entitled to use it, or you might have to wait in a queue in order to use it. So if you have a deadline, for instance, uh, you might not meet your deadline because you're stuck in a queue to use it. And cloud computing, um, in many ways, solves a lot of those problems because it's available absolutely when you when you need it. And so cloud computing comes in different flavors. And if you look up anything around cloud computing, you'll see these acronyms um, that come up. And so so basically, sort of three flavors. Um, one of the, maybe I'll start on the right hand side. So software as a service is really what you see as an end user. So again, email, photo sharing, things like SkyDrive, Office 365, uh, those are software as a service. So you see those essentially as um, something that you use from your device. Um, platform as a service is what's used to deliver that software. So that could be a database, for instance. So SQL Azure allows you to scale out a database uh, on the cloud. And it's that sort of high level. So you worry about the application and the data, but you don't worry about everything underneath that. Um, what you can do is if you go to that lower level, we call that infrastructure as a service, where you're dealing with a virtual computer, a virtual machine, and you do have to manage everything from the operating system up from the operating system. So for instance, you might have to apply patches to the operating system, whereas with platform as a service, you don't have to worry about that because the cloud computing uh, provider um, does that for you. So it allows you to focus a bit more on what you're really trying to achieve. Um, and so on Windows Azure, we have these sort of three particular characters. There's the virtual machines. Uh, we have these cloud services, these high-level services, and then just websites. So standard websites as well as um, uh, standard websites uh, like WordPress, uh, but also CMSs like, uh, like Drupal, for instance. So Windows Azure itself um, uh, is, is lots and lots of different things, um, but from a very high level, it's basically this huge computing platform that's global, that's got millions of servers, uh, and you can run any application on there. You can run any, use any language. Uh, so not just Microsoft.NET languages like C Sharp and F Sharp, but critically things like Python, which is obviously very popular within scientific domains, Java, PHP, Node.js. Uh, one of the new features we've added is the ability to run Linux. So we really want uh, people to be taking advantage of Windows Azure using their Linux virtual machines because we know a lot of people have those sort of prepackaged uh, pieces of software that they can just put up onto Windows Azure as Linux VMs. 
Um, and other technologies like big data analysis, like Hadoop um, and HD Insight, for instance. So, um, so one of the things about um, uh, Azure is, again, it's very flexible and open. So if we look at the bottom left there, actually all of our SDKs are available on GitHub. Um, and at the top there, you can see our developer portal, which is um, supports, again, all these different languages. In the bottom right, you can see the virtual machines and a whole different variety of different Linux flavors and things like Oracle, as well as, of course, of Windows Server and SQL Server and all the sort of Microsoft products on there as well. And we have a nice uh, depot called the VM Depot where you can take a virtual machine. So we've built one here called the Azure Data Science Core, which has got Python. It's got Scikit-Learn for machine, machine learning. It's got things like Matplotlib, Pandas for data integration. Uh, and it's even got things like Storm and Kafka, which are uh, big data technologies used by companies like LinkedIn and Twitter for managing all of the message queuing. Uh, we've packaged all that up into a, a, a Linux VM, put that on VM Depot, so anybody around the world can go into the Windows Azure portal and deploy this virtual machine just, just a few mouse clicks. It's a great way of making your research software available to, to the global community. And so we're very excited about VM Depot and people. We have one called Via Linux and CCAN, which is a data management uh, uh, system. Uh, and then on Azure, we have Compute, so you can run on lots of CPUs. Uh, but also, it's very important for being able to manage your data. So we have different types of storage on Azure. We have what are called blobs. So this is akin to sort of file storage. And then we have drives, which is what we use, for instance, with our, within our virtual machines. We have this interesting store called table, which is structured storage, but it's not a relational database. We also do have SQL Azure, which is a full-blown relational database. The tables scale massively across the cloud on thousands of nodes. So if you don't need that true relational capability, tables are a great way to manage lots and lots of data. And then queues allow us to actually manage messages in a very reliable and secure way. So again, this combination of features means that we can put together different cloud services in a very nice way. So a, a, a use case here would be a hybrid cloud where I might have a lot of data, say climate data in a local data center. I could, well, I want to run lots of processing so I could uh, take a copy of my working set that I'm interested in, push that up into Windows Azure, spin up, say, 20 or 30 virtual machines, use those to run my processing, and when it's done, download onto my machine, and then I can turn off all of those uh, machines in Windows Azure. And on Windows Azure, you only pay per minute. Um, so it it's really can be quite cost effective to be able to just spin up 100 machines for, say, half an hour, and then spin them down again. And it, you know, costs a few cents per hour, uh, and so if you have that type of burst processing where you just want to do a bunch of processing and then finish with that and you want to do some analysis, it's a really good scenario for, for cloud computing. So I quickly want to run through a few different scenarios before I hand over to, to Tanya and, and Christian. So around data, we have this interesting uh, tool called Fetch Climate, and this is clustered in Azure. It's got you know tens of terabytes of data on the back end, different types of environmental data. And it's an intelligent service. So you, you put in queries and it, it just returns uh, for instance, here you can see uh, air, air temperature um, across the world and soil mo moisture across the world. And you just point and click, you draw a box, you say, show me all the air temperature between, um, what is it, 1960, 1969, and it goes away, uh, finds the data set uh, or multiple data sets, picks the one with the lowest uncertainty, and then returns it, and you can download that as a file. So again, it's a, a service which hides much of the complexity around environmental data behind a very nice web front end, but not just a web front end, but also a set of APIs so that you can use this from R, C Sharp, and other, other tools as well. Um, there are these ideas of data marketplaces as well, and, and, and actual data marketplace is a place where, for instance, you can get the weather forecast data for the UK. Um, uh, so if you do a web search on open weather data, Azure, you can get these five-day forecasts for the UK. And when you make your data available on, on the cloud, you can see here the request. You might expect all the requests for this to come from the UK, um, but actually as many come from the US and worldwide. So making that your local data available um, is, uh, is, you know, is, is very, very good. Um, so... Um, and so here are another just couple of examples in the UK. The Environment Agency um, publishes its flood warning data through Facebook, uh, all streamed out from Windows Azure. Um, and again, it gives them that scale. Uh, we had some floods here in the UK recently, and obviously uh, the website and the, the flood uh, warning system, uh, you know, everybody looks at that. So the cloud allows you to scale that out. 
Another example here is the UK Crown Estate, where they're publishing terabytes of data uh, for the uh, water, you know, the uh, marine area around the UK coastline um, to make that available, for instance, for people doing planning for wind farms and other development around the coast. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit about modeling. So one of the uh, systems we built, one of my colleagues, Wen Minye, has built this uh, point-and-click weather forecasting service. So basically, we've taken the NCAR weather forecasting code, uh, moved that onto Windows Azure, so you can literally point-and-click on a map and generate a forecast. And so we've run, you know, uh, over 1,500 simulations in a year, um, you know, with cities, and it takes a few hours to run. Um, but it's basically, again, hiding the complexity of this typical sort of high-performance computing, complex task of running a weather forecast. We're making that really, really simple through the cloud. Um, and this is just shows you go to weatherservice.cloudup.net. You can go into the gallery and see different weather forecasts, and you can see things like precipitation and temperature contour plots, you know, over time over those days, and you can see where all the forecasts have been made. So it's a really nice uh, example where we've wrapped this quite complex pipeline of pulling in data, pulling in the observational data, uh, and then creating uh, a parallel job which runs, you know, this high-resolution weather forecast and then does the post-processing out into Bing Maps. And so we've, again, hidden this complexity um, behind using the cloud, and it gives us that scalability. And this just shows the, the management portal for Windows Azure, um, uh, and it's got, uh, you know, we can run on hundreds of cores, and you can see it ramping up. And when we ramp up, one of the nice things that you can do is you can elastically, uh, you can scale the available number of cores here. So you can see 12 instances where each one of these VMs is actually 16 cores. Um, and we can expand that out. And as the system loads up, you can get Azure to spin up more virtual machines to, to make sure it can manage the load. So again, it's one of the um, uh, you know really nice nice features of using a sort of cloud service. Um, and again, with MATLAB, we can use this, what we call the HPC Cluster Manager, and this just shows the front end to that. If you look at the, the link here under our, this is actually Azure for Research.com technical papers page. There's a whole documentation on how to do this. Um, but if you look at where we have parametric sweep job, um, we get a nice little uh, window up here. We can put in the details of our executable and the different parameters we want to sweep over. We could click Submit. It pushes that up into Azure, and then when it runs the jobs, it pushes here. You can see actually these different MATLAB results files come through, and this is showing us what's on the Azure uh, storage. And then we can run just a little uh, PowerShell uh, to actually look at the, uh, in this case, a banana minimization uh, calculation. So again, makes it very easy, again, hiding that complexity for doing scale that MATLAB on Windows Azure. And again, the technical report goes into a bit more detail on that, so do have a look at that. Um, and just finally, I want to talk about um, Distribution Modeler, which is, again, one of the projects here in Cambridge, uh, where we're building this modeling pipeline, which uses fetch climate to pull in data, and then we can write models. Uh, and it, it records the provenance of those models, and then we can share those models on SkyDrive, and we're moving this to run in Azure. Um, here you can see actually a fire prediction. We're doing things like wheat prediction models. Um, and again, we're really excited about being able to use the cloud in this very sort of scale that way um, so people can do much better collaborative uh, science. Um, so that hopefully shows uh, you know a bit of background on where we think environmental science is, what Windows Azure is, how Windows Azure uh, can be used very effectively for different scenarios uh, in environmental science. Um, and again, our Windows Azure for Research uh, program, azureforresearch.com, is where you'll find all this information. Uh, we actually have these research awards every couple of months. Um, we will um, give out about 12 months' worth of Windows Azure resources of compute uh, and data, so you can do a pretty good pilot project at scale, um, so you can experiment. And so um, do have a look at those. Um, we've done already funded quite a few in the environmental science domain, in urban computing. We are running training programs globally as well. We've run some in um, China, in Korea, in France, in Switzerland, in South Africa. We're going around the world to have a look, find out which course is nearest to you. It's no cost to you uh, to attend the course, and you'll get a six-month Azure class if you attend the course. So. Um, do have a look and do come along to one of those training courses. Do we have this webinar series? Um, and there are other webinars, and these are being made available online on demand afterwards on, on Microsoft Research and also on YouTube. Um, and then the technical papers. So there are, I think, half a dozen technical papers, but we've got more in the pipeline. So do have a look, because those are real deep dives into many of the things. There's a great one around using Python with Windows Azure, for instance, and storage and scale out. 
Um, and we are coming to conferences. We were just at the um, AGU conference in San Francisco recently um, and, you know, really want to talk to you and work with the community around what can be done with Windows Azure through this program. Uh, it's really what this program uh, is aimed at. Um, so that's really what I wanted to say around cloud and environmental science to, to, to set the context and hopefully give you some information on that. Um, but I'm really excited to be able to hand over to um, some of our friends, Tanya and Christian. So um, I'd like to hand over to, to Tanya. Um, I think we need to switch. So I guess, Stephanie, if you could switch slide decks, um, then um, over to Tanya. And she's going to talk for a little while about some of the great work um, that she's doing. Hi, everybody. It's um, Tanya Berger wolf from University of Illinois at Chicago. Um, I work in computational ecology, so I'm a computer scientist who works with ecologists uh, to um, to go from data, this is data intensive, uh, to, to insight, to scientific insight, and we also create, uh, go out further to education, uh, outreach, and to uh, to to museums and zoos. And I'll talk a little bit about it, how all of this can be done on the web. So uh, what we're really, we look at uh, the whole pipeline as the ecological information system. So this is from data um, to visualization and outreach. Every part of it is really, uh, has to be done on the, on the cloud because every part of it is a huge collaboration across three or more continents and many, many people and uh, with big computational resources. So I'll give you a little bit of a taste of what, what is it that we're actually doing and how that uh, is done on the cloud with the resources available from Windows Azure in this case. So what my area of ecology, particularly I work with biologists who are interested in social species and the social behavior of animals. So typical, the typical data collection um, uh, until very recently, the typical data collection process is a scientist, in this case, um, watching uh, gelada baboons in uh, Ethiopia or somewhere else around the world, writing things on paper these days, moving a little bit more to tablet, um, and uh, sort of in a very distributed, asynchronous way, collecting information about pop one particular population of one particular species. If we want to have uh, information, this information sort of aggregated over time, over uh, different uh, views of the same population. Even with paper or tablet, we need to be able to store that data in an asynchronous, distributed way where there is also access control because um, there are many people who are working on this data. There are some of them are scientists, some of them are field assistants, some of them may be citizen scientists. So different uh, people have different access to the data, different uh, permissions to do things with the data. Uh, anywhere from just dumping unstructured information to uh, cleaning data, looking for outliers, looking for actual information, which would be scientists. So today we're moving to sensor-based collection of the same data. So we're putting sensors, GPS colors, proximity sensors, um, other radio colors, on, on animals, so in this case, this is uh, we're working with zebras, baboons in Kenya. The, uh, there's a little picture of a Mataki device developed by Microsoft, uh, but in collaboration um, uh, with scientists who, in collaboration with Microsoft Research, within project in Cambridge with the Project Technology for Nature. But um, uh, so, so all of this information, there is uh, up on top, there is. Uh, a, a picture of a project, current project we have with the Boons in Kenya where we put GPS collars tracking an entire troop over 30 days at um, 30, it, one second resolution, 30 baboons. So this is highly distributed and now massive data. So it's the same kind of as the observation on, on paper by a scientist because it's done by many people with different permissions and in a distributed way, but now it's also massive. Each baboon in this study has 20 million data points associated with it. It's also typically um, the problem with uh, this kind of data collection is that it's done in areas like Kenya, like Ethiopia, in remote areas, typically uninstrumented environments, so you can't really have high bandwidth data push real time, so we have to build different cloud solutions that, uh, that, that take this data in an asynchronous way, uh, but yet 
make it available on demand. And so we're, we're building solutions now of extracting features directly from data where the storage, the data storage can be sort of raw data massively on the, on the big server, but the pushback is at a feature level which is useful for particular query, and that has to be done very carefully. So other modes of data collection that are coming uh, today are images, huge, huge, huge number of images coming from uh, camera traps. The, these are students in a course that we teach where we bring computer scientists and ecology students to Kenya for a three-week interdisciplinary uh, course where they do field work and design computational solutions and interdisciplinary solutions to ecological problems. Uh, or uh, tourists coming to safaris and uh, field scientists and field assistants take, taking hundreds of thousands of images of particularly charismatic animals like zebras, giraffes, uh, lions, and cheetahs. But also we find today millions of pictures uh, from accidental citizen scientists seeing birds and butterflies and insects, other insects and, um, uh, and even deer in the, their backyard or squirrels. So all of this allows us, if we process it and extract the information about individual animals, we can get information about uh, species and populations at a global level. That means we actually have to process all of that information from the distributed in some way put it together and, um, and, and be able to then use modern image processing tools, some of which we have developed to identify any spotted or striped animal individual. This is Hot Spotter in collaboration uh, with my colleagues from Rensselaer Polytechnical Institute. So using these tools, we can actually now create global views or even entire big area views of populations where we're building um, combining images from all their sources into one population view. And um, we're scaling this up today to, uh, to use drones and aerial vehicles or other with video um, attached to this, uh, to this airplanes or stationary videos, which you see in the bottom, to track ants, in this case, in the wild. So again, many, uh, in this particular case, the data accumulates very quickly and has to be uploaded and processed uh, very quickly on, um, on the cloud, but also some of the processing, processing has to be done locally, some of, the, uh, some of it has to be done globally. So the, the system in this case is a hybrid system that we built. So all of these data sources and um, uh, another big source of data today is citizen science. So citizen science is used in our studies at three points, data collection, uh, something like Instant Wild, for example, on the top right, which is another Microsoft research project, or iNaturalist.org, or WildMe, or many other image uh, data collection sources, uh, like tourists on Safari. So this is data collection, uh, data processing, uh, where uh, citizen scientists help uh, help com computer vision uh, algorithms, for example, to create training data and to improve the accuracy of species detection and individual detection animal in the images. And that's something like Snapshot Serengeti platform that can be leveraged. And we're building our own wild, uh, based on WildMe project. So, and finally, citizen scientists are, of course, uh, people who are engaged in science, engaged in conservation, engaged in the, increasing, in the uh, goal of increasing biodiversity and maintaining biodiversity in the world. So their action, um, they, they can be called to action uh, through this uh, engagement in the actual process of making science. So, however, uh, the issues of data access and representation becomes a big issue when we want to, to display data in different views to different parts of the citizen scientists and then also create, have to manage access control. So all of these data come together into one view and um, as I mentioned, different uh, sources, different highly distributed, asynchronous with access control, hybrid real time and uh, uh, sort of backhand com heavy computation. And they come together in various forms. Uh, Kenji talked a little bit about uh, 
unstructured to to sort of no SQL tables to uh, full fledged SQL relational databases and in fact uh, on Azure you can add your own database platform if you need databases for uh, for, for network we, we use a lot of social network analysis, so for network analysis, there are specialized databases that can handle and support those queries, or if you want to connect to GIS systems, so there you can do that through um, through relational databases and APIs directly or, or, to, or to use Esri API directly from Azure. So once we have data, um, a lot of analysis happens, and my main, sort of the focus on my research is to develop these analysis tools to extract information from about location um, and semantics of location of animal movement, of uh, social interactions and proximity networks over time, and um, sort of the, the, the analysis for dynamic social networks that arise from that, uh, everything from identifying time scale, predicting uh, config the topology of these networks, identifying uh, persistent communities over time, all of these tools we've developed in my lab. And uh, uh, they're developed collaboratively. They're computation intensive. So the main point of cloud services here is uh, uh, cloud as a service. So we use Hadoop. We use high performance computing heavily and develop some of the met methodology um, uh, algorithmic methodology behind it. And so once, um, and this is a, a, a iterative loop, we develop tools, we discuss it, all of it collaboratively, typically cl across uh, three continents and five different time zones. Uh, back to computation, again, results of the computation, we, everybody has to see them at the same time. Discussion, back to computation on, and uh, tool development. Once all of that is done, we can now uh, produce deliverables such as models and computational tools. We can visualize results and we can um, work with uh, out our outreach projects to uh, create uh, education and outreach um, uh, deliverables. And so I'll show you just a taste of those. For visualization, we're talking some of the unique visualization uh, uh, projects that we have in the process right now is in collaboration with Electronic Visualization Lab at UIC, and that's um, uh, the home of uh, Cave 2, virtual reality, immersive virtual reality uh, platform with its uh, fully surrounding uh, 3D um, uh, collaborative uh, space. So uh, this is 32, 32 simultaneous servers uh, serving uh, giving the, the, for example, landscape information and simulated as well as overlaid real animal population movement and interaction data uh, that where, where we can uh, create augmented virtual reality and give the scientists the space where they can leverage the intuition of field observations but on simulated and processed and then analyzed data and sort of cr close this loop very, very quickly. Uh, so. Again, this is massively computation intensive. It's combination, um, it's unique platform. We're working closely with the Worldwide Telescope team at Microsoft Research. When, and is a lot of the data, it's hybrid cloud services served both locally and from the cloud and uh, creating this unique uh, virtual reality field biology lab, essentially. Um, for the outreach activities and educational activities, we are working with the Chicago Public Schools and the suburban schools to create um, uh, this urban safari and animal stories project where it's going to become part of the science curriculum, hopefully, at uh, schools based on a lot of the ideas from the project. And so uh, the data that they see in, this, um, in these uh, projects when they uh, go to uh, compare what they see in their backyard through camera traps that are deployed to compare it to what uh, they would see in a safari or in in, in uh, nature preserve in Kenya. Those data are from the cloud, pre-computed with pre-computed analysis pushed directly to the classroom. Um, and similar project we have uh, uh, with the Brookfield in collaboration with Brookfield Zoo. Again, when you see an animal such as a zebra at the zoo and compare it to its wild behavior in the in Kenya. Um, so there is a combination of real-time and stored push data uh, through the cloud where we're also in the future hoping that all visitors to the zoo will be able to download a mobile app 
as they enter that they can sort of ask questions and uh, interactively about the data about wild, of wild populations of the same species. So that's a brief tour of uh, animal eco computational ecology on the cloud and uh, my own social network. If you're a collaboration network, uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks very much, Tanya, for that. It was fantastic uh, to see how uh, you're using the cloud, but integrating it with all the other um, great sort of ways of going out into the field and doing the analysis. So, um, uh, so that's great. So, I'd like to hand over to Christian now, if we can switch slide decks, uh, who's going to tell us a little bit about the uh, the Live Andes project. So, um, over to you, Christian. Hi, thank you. Yeah, it's a great pleasure to to be part of this conference. Let me talk to you about the advanced networks of the distribution of endangered species. This is a research project that we started as wildlife ecologists working in a partnership with computer engineers from our university, in Catholic University in Santiago of Chile. Basically, what we were looking at is how we could approach the data in the field in a way that can be shared and sustained for future analysis, regardless the source of, of the, the source of the data that you you have in a given expedition or in a given scientific work or even a casual encounter by a citizen scientist. Basically what we want to put together is the the opportunity of citizen scientists plus wildlife park rangers or even students that are going to the, into the wild and some Sometimes they find animals or they find interesting things to report, and they don't have any way to report it. Perhaps an email or perhaps saying something to the park ranger, but that information is not shared, it's not available for future analysis, and it's not used by any agency or scientific community. So if you close the loop between the species in the wild being encountered casually or by chance by people, with citizen science decision makers and the scientific community, we can start put, putting together an interesting uh, pattern behind in simple observations. So Life Analysis is a platform that firstly was developed in Chile by us for, for our country and this, a few years ago, where you can share information, you can upload into your account, your sighting, but you can also see and look into the other people's sightings that are organized by time, by location, and by the list of species, terrestrial species that we have in Chile. You can also enjoy um, a multi a multimedia uh, web-based encyclopedia of all the main species using Bing Maps and using a uh, search engine that are connected into this life on this platform. But the challenge was how could it scale up into something global? So that's why why we started to think about using Windows Azure. Actually, our our structure or the software structure is very simple. Uh, um, when you have an, uh, a sighting, you can upload that using mobile devices like mobile phones, and then immediately that information, the location, the date and the species, and any other note that you have will be shared and available for everybody. But then, also, you would like to see what's going on with wildlife around you or in a given place, and then the tools for visualization are very important. So that's where Silverlight will enter, Bing Maps technology were used, and, and in, the, in the sense of access for a database, you can go backwards, you look for, for data from previous years, and you could do some predictions forward in a simple way by having an understanding of what's going on in the long run with the species that you are looking at. So we need, we need to move forward in terms of going beyond Chile, and that's why we started to plan a new architecture and new structure, which is um, using Windows Azure. So we need to move forward to work offline in remote areas, in national parks or in the Andean region or the Amazon, 
and we need to allow people to upload and download or visualize information very quickly. So from that point of view, a single server in a given place wasn't really a good option. That's why we started to explore the next step to go into the cloud. So in that sense, we, we have been using several Microsoft technologies to enter the sites to protect for security and the accounts and to do some polygons or using visual and spatial information uh, in a very simple way. So the, the big step was now, for the last three to four months, we have been uploading a new version of Life Analyst, which is called Life Analyst 2.0, into Windows Azure to really use the best of the cloud power and then to be able to integrate our our software for different countries in the Americas as a first step. So the idea is that we we can use the current technology like Bing Mac, Execute Azure together and also in a way that you could easily find search or quest for given data in, in different places, regardless where you are in the world. Why is this important? Because when you have the opportunity to use uh, the cloud, you have more options to, to have a, a very fast search or use multiple resources like images, sound, video, and also uh, geo locations. So the wireless data, for example, we were testing this this software by using wireless data from previous 10 years environmental impact assessment in our country, and then we were looking for searching the database to find out how important and how useful were all the environmental impact assessments that we, we collected and uploaded into the database to do some predictions uh, in the future. And, and then we, we, we realized that staying in a server or in a single server won't be possible if this thing goes global. So that's why we started to think about using Azure architecture and using the services that Azure provides to us as, 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 as we develop the new version of this life on this. So the idea is that people can use computers but also can use multiple devices, mobile devices like mobile phones, different operating system to input information into, into our software. So that's why the REST API worker role is so important and then how we keep the information and how we store information and process the information is more up to Azure to solve all these issues than us in a, in a given server. So another important thing about Azure is that allow us to have fast requests and have fast functioning of this life funding, regardless where you are, because of the global coverage of, of Azure around the world, and also allow us to integrate complicated search or multiple search at one at one time or at the same time, only with one click, and allows us not to be worried about the different platforms, the different search engines or the different mapping systems that people are using because the interoperability of, of Azure for, for life and this. So those things make us to think that it was a good idea to do this next step. So how we foresee the future? See, you can, here you can see a, a mountain lion in the north of Chile in the Andes. Our, our aim is that at the end of the day, people can use life families to get closer to nature, to understand patterns of wild animals in the wild, to share information, to provide a platform to different environmental agencies, agricultural agencies that need to know more about the distribution of the species and about the current situation of the species in a given place. So looking into so many requests that we have from IUCN or the Biodiversity Convention, 
that we have to list and classify and understand the current situation of our wildlife in every single country. Actually, the role of citizen scientists and the role of previous information stored in a very accessible and simple way is crucial to understand how it's going to be the fate of wildlife in the near future. That is all what I wanted to tell you now, and I'm ready for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. That was uh, absolutely fantastic to hear about Live Andes, um, which again, you know, it's been a very successful project, and how you're planning to move that to Azure um, to make it even better and more scalable and usable by uh, by all of the users. So, uh, so thank you for that. Um, so, just switching back to to my uh, original slide deck, um, just really want to uh, wrap up uh, looking at uh, actually one. Uh, project that uh, that we've been doing with, is with a young Rao Ryu at, at um, Seoul National University who's been using NASA MODIS data, um, which was quite difficult. Here you can see him in his office with his computer, um, and he was very constrained with his computer. And so the MODIS data is available, um, made available from from NASA, this great uh, satellite imagery data set. Um, but it's quite large. Um, and in order to process it, you need quite a lot of computing power. So we worked with a number of researchers um, at University of Virginia, um, Berkeley, Stanford, um, and with some of our folks in Microsoft Research to build out this platform um, called Modus Azure, uh, which takes in the NASA data uh, and then does a uh, lot of reprojection and calculation in order to produce actually a VAFO transpiration data. Um, and that's um, then uh, was pushed out so that scientists can download that, um, which again still meant there was a visualization problem. Um, so what we've done most recently uh, in the last few few months is to push the data into Fetch Climate. So the entire pipeline uh, is in the cloud, so none of it actually touches uh, Jungwell's desktop machine until he's ready right at the end of the analysis and might want to pull down the data from Fetch Climate. Um, so it's a really interesting example of this sort of big data in terms of just extending what uh, Jungwell is able to do on his desktop, but making best use of the cloud with these great uh, available data sets, but doing some pretty heavyweight processing and visualization in the cloud. Um, so the opportunity really is to take where we are, it's about climbing the ladder, going from data to information to insight and ultimately to decisions and policy, um, is moving from this world today where researchers are often constrained by their laptops, um, HPC systems and clusters um, are you know, fantastic machines, um, but used by relatively um, smaller numbers of scientists. Um, and that many, many researchers are unable to use those resources, not because they're not available necessarily, but obviously skills um, uh, enable to use those, um, to move to a world where really we have a unified community where those supercomputer users and cluster users are able to more readily um, distribute and disseminate their data so that other scientists and researchers can make use of it. Uh, and then once that data is available, the ability to run analysis against it using the cloud um, and to marshal resources, so not caring or knowing how some computation gets done, because as a scientist, you just want to get on with the science. And that's the sort of world that we're, we're trying to move to and hoping to move to, and that's what our actual for research program is really aimed at. Um, so do um, have a look at actualforresearch.com uh, and join the LinkedIn group to, to keep uh, track of things. Uh, and, you know, please do look at applying for an award, coming to some of our training, taking advantage of all of the things that we're, we're making available. So, so with that, I would like to uh, thank everybody um, for coming. Um, and uh, do, you know, keep in touch, like I said, through, through the LinkedIn group. Uh, these webinars will be, uh, are available online. Um, so do um, share these with your colleagues. So I just want to thank you all for coming. Uh, to to the webinar today. So uh, thank you, everyone. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Kenji. Um, I have enabled our survey for this webcast. Uh, we hope you found today's information helpful. If you enjoyed today's webcast or have feedback on how we can provide you with a better event, please let us know by completing this survey. The scores are on a scale of 1 to 5, with 5 being the highest possible score. This concludes today's Academy Live session. As a reminder, you will be able to access a replay of this webcast via a link that will be distributed via email post-session. 
like to extend another big thank you to our presenters, Kenji, Tanya, and Christian, and we'd like to thank you for joining our Academy webcast. You may now disconnect from this call. Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Thank you.